Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Roth, and I'm a program manager on the ASP.NET team. And just a few weeks ago, uh, we shipped ASP.NET Core 2.0 along with .NET Core 2.0. And I'm excited to tell you about this uh, new release. Um, the bits are still hot off the build servers, and we've got a lot of great stuff to show you. Here's a set of features that I'm going to be showing you today. Uh, first of all, it's a lot easier to get started faster with ASP.NET Core uh, 2.0. There's fewer files you have to deal with, fewer lines of code. We've introduced a new application model that's page-based. We call it Razor Pages. That makes it super easy to write uh, dynamic uh, UI, web UI. Uh, we've also completely revamped the uh, authentication system so that it's easier to configure, enables new features, and we've also added support for two-factor authentication uh, using authenticator apps. Uh, we've added new templates uh, for single-page application frameworks like Angular, React, Re React plus Redux. Uh, we've turned on uh, page and view compilation by default so that your startup times for your applications are much faster. Uh, we've also increased performance across the board. Uh, throughput is about 20% faster in ASP.NET Core 2.0 uh, from 1.1. Uh, we've also enabled seamless di diagnostics that we can light up for your application um, just by virtue of you being an ASP.NET Core app, either running in Azure or also running in development in Visual Studio. Now, ASP.NET Core, of course, is part of a unified .NET platform. Uh, that uh, is, is good for a variety of application types. But as that whole platform gets better, so does ASP.NET Core. Uh, for example, one of the great new features in .NET Core 2.0 is support for .NET Standard 2.0. Uh, .NET Standard 2.0 adds tens of thousands of APIs to the standard .NET platform. In fact, there are uh, so many new APIs in .NET Standard 2.0 that there's now compatibility with uh, full .NET framework libraries that you can just reference from your .NET Core applications and they just work. .NET Core 2.0 supports all of .NET Standard 2.0. What does that mean for your ASP.NET Core apps? Well, that first of all means you get to use all those APIs. You can, you know, all the new data APIs, XML, serialization, networking, they're all there ready for you to use. Uh, also, your, you can continue to use your existing .NET Framework assets. Now, how do you get started with ASP.NET Core 2.0? Well, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go get .NET Core 2.0, which has everything that you need uh, to get started writing web applications. You're going to want to go to .NET slash core and download the .NET Core uh, um, uh, distribution for the platform that you want to run on. Uh, also, you're going to want to go get Visual Studio. So go to visualstudio.com and download the, the Visual Studio for your platform of choice. On um, Windows, that would of course be Visual Studio for Windows. There's now Visual Studio for Mac, which supports ASP.NET Core 2.0, which is great. Uh, if you prefer a lightweight text editor, go get Visual Studio Code. Well, let's go get started. All right. So first of all, uh, on my laptop, I've already gone and gone to the .NET uh, slash core website, and I've installed .NET Core on my machine. And as you can see, there, you can install for Windows, you can install for Linux, install for Mac. There are also Docker images that you can use if you prefer to run in Docker. I've also already gone to visualstudio.com, and I've installed Visual Studio, full Visual Studio on my machine. Uh, if you're on a Mac, feel free to install Visual Studio for Mac. That's available here. Uh, if you prefer a lightweight text editor, uh, Visual Studio Code is great. I've also got that installed because I find it's, it's nice for, for simple scenarios. OK, so let me, let, let me show you how easy it is to get started with writing a new web app. I'm going to pop up a command prompt here and show you that, yes, in fact, we do have .NET Core 2.0 installed. So I'm going to do .NET dash dash version. And we see we have the 2.0 version of .NET Core on my machine, which means I also have ASP.NET Core 2.0 on this machine. OK, let's create a new web application. I'm going to do .NET new web. And let's specify an output directory. Let's say my app as the output. All right, great. So that's creating my project. Now, notice that it's also kicking off a NuGet restore as part of creating the project. You no longer have to do that manually after creating a project using a .NET new. It'll just do it for you, which is, which is nice. You know, one less step. OK, let's go into that directory. And let's see what we got. Let's, uh, let's actually see what we got in Visual Studio Code. OK, so here's my application. First, let's take a look at the project file. 
I'm gonna make that a little bigger so we can see. Okay. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that there's only one package reference in this application, this Microsoft ASP.NET Core All package. That is the only package that you need in order to be able to create an ASP.NET Core 2.0 application. It is a what we call a meta package that literally brings in every single ASP.NET Core package. So they're all there. You no longer need to go find out which specific package you need to use in order to use a particular feature. There, it's, it's already there as part of your application. Also, you notice that there's just a single version that you have to worry about now. The version of this package is the version of the product. That's all you have to worry about. You no longer have to worry about different packages with different versions and version incompatibilities. There's one version that you just need to, to use, which is the version of the product. So that's super convenient. Now, um, this doesn't mean that package restore suddenly gets really, really slow because you're having to restore all these packages. All of ASP.NET Core 2.0 is already included with .NET Core 2.0 when you installed it. So package restore is, is virtually instantaneous. Um, also, when you publish your application, your application is actually smaller with ASP.NET Core 2.0 than it was with 1.1. And that's thanks to a new feature in .NET Core 2.0 called the Runtime Store. The .NET Core Runtime Store already includes all of the ASP.NET Core uh, binaries, and they're already cross-gen and warmed up and ready to, ready to go. So your app no longer has to bring those binaries with it. They're already there. So we trim them out, which means that your app is m actually significantly smaller than it would be with, uh, with a 1.1 app. Cool. Uh, what else? Let's look at program CS. Let's look at the program main function where we actually set up ASP.NET Core hosting uh, within this app. Uh, this code is also significantly simpler than in 1.1. In 1.1, you would have some code here that sets up your host, and you would have to do a few minutiae. You would have to you know, set up which HTTP server you want to use, like use Kestrel. Uh, you would have to specify your content route that you want to use. You'd specify, you know, I, uh, enable IIS integration if you want to host behind IIS. You no longer have to do any of that thanks to this new default web host builder that we give to you out of the box. That default web host builder will take care of all those details for you. It will go ahead and set up Kestrel. It will set up your content route. It will set up IS, uh, IIS integration for you. So that's just done. You don't have to worry about it. Less code for you to have to, to write. Okay, and then if we look at the startup class, which is you know your actual app, this is a pretty simple app. It's just hello world, it's just returning a static string. So let's go ahead and run this. And doing a .NET run, that will of course build the application and then fire up, uh, execute it, which then uh, uh, sets up the, the server. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, pop open a browser and let's browse to the address, local is 5000, and yep, okay, there we see, hello world, so it's working. Now returning a static string, you know, that's not super exciting. Um, let me show you how easy it is now in ASP.NET Core 2.0 to return some dynamically uh, rendered HTML. So I'm gonna, let's, uh, let's shut this down, and let's go back to the app, and I'm just gonna do a couple simple things. First, let's add MVC. So services.addMVC. Great. And then app.run, instead of just returning a static string, let's replace that with just, let's just use MVC. Okay, I don't have to add any packages because the packages are already included as part of that meta package. It's already there. Everything's already there. All right, great. And now to add some UI, I'm just going to add a page. So let me go to my, uh, my folder. Let's add a, a new folder called pages. And I'm going to add a page to this folder. Let's call it index.cshtml. Okay, now to signal, and do we want to have some build assets? Sure, go ahead, add some build assets for us. That's great. Okay, um, to signal that this is a page, the only thing I need to do is say at page, use the page directive. And now I have some razor that I can write to dynamically render some HTML. So for example, let's, um, let's add a little header in here and say the time is, let's switch to C sharp, date time dot now, you know, whatever it is currently. Okay, I think you did that right. Let's run it again. All right, so the app is running. Let's go back to our page, and if I refresh, yeah, so now we see, and this is, this is not just static content. This is now being dynamically generated on the server. We're actually executing Razor just by adding a page. It's just that simple. So super easy to get started with ASP.NET Core 2.0. Um, to do Razor, you just add a page. We call that feature Razor Pages, and we'll talk more about it uh, in a little bit. Okay, um, I think at this point, what I want to do is let's actually let's go over to Visual Studio now. I, I, I personally prefer to work in a uh, fully uh, featured IDE. So let's shut down the app. We'll go, we can close uh, Visual Studio Code at this point, I think. 
And let's open that app in Visual Studio. So I think I have it here. Yeah, great. All right. So in Visual Studio, we'll, we should see exactly the same app. You know, we have a single page as soon as it, as soon as it loads up. And um, next thing I want to do, let's, let's take another look. Actually, now that we're in Visual Studio, we can leverage some of the nice Visual Studio features. You know, I mentioned that meta package that it pulls in all the packages. You can actually see that. Like the packages are still there. If we look at the Solution Explorer and we expand the NuGet node and look at that meta package, there they all are. So if you want to reference the individual packages, you still can. Uh, and in fact, if you're running on the .NET framework, you probably still should because the .NET framework doesn't have that runtime store feature that we that is with .NET Core. Um, but for most applications, referencing the meta package is what you're going to want to do. Okay, let's go to back to startup for a second because there's a couple interesting things about this file that you know also seem to be you know no, no longer there. And what's that about? So for, for example, first of all, there's no configuration being set up in this startup class. Uh, that's because we decided in 2.0 that configuration is so important that it should actually be part of, of ASP.NET Core. So we actually set up configuration now at the hosting layer in ASP.NET Core. And we make it available to the application through dependency injection. So if you need config, you can just inject it wherever you need it and, and use it. Uh, also, that default web host builder that I showed you previously, that will go ahead and add all of the normal configuration providers for you. So it will add a provider for appsettings.json. It will add a provider for appsettings.environment.json, for user secrets, for environment variables, for even the uh, command line arguments uh, for, for the application. That's already there. It's set up. It's ready to go. So we can just use it. Uh, this app doesn't have a config file yet Let me because I started with empty, but let's, let's go ahead and add one. Add a new item. Let's do config. Where is it? App, yeah, ASP.NET config file, appsettings.json. That's what we want. All right, cool. And we got a little config file now. Let's just add a, a little property here. Let's call it message. And let's say, you know, hello from config. OK, save that. And I should just be able to use that. Um, where do I want to use config from? For this, for just a simple case, I'm going to use it actually right from the page. Let's just use the, the configuration right in the page. So this is just, just Razor, so I can at inject whatever I want, and I'm going to inject an I configuration. Let's call this it's basically a property. Let's call this property configuration. Uh, looks like I need a using statement. That's fine. We'll just you know, do Microsoft extensions dot configuration, and hopefully if I did that right, yeah, okay, we're getting that red squiggly to go away. Okay, so now let's just use config from within my page. So I'm going to create a, another header, and let's just switch to C sharp and go configuration, and uh, use. Let's get the message. So let's save that, and I don't have, have I run this app yet. I don't think I've run it yet from VS. So let's let's actually run it. So build started, and hopefully we should see um, not only the current time but also our little com uh, message from from configuration. Okay, there goes Chrome it's popping up, letting the server wake up, and yeah, we get hello from config. So config is now available in DI. You can just use it, and we set up a bunch of default config providers for you. Now, another thing you might notice that's not in Startup CS anymore is there's, there's no longer any logging provider configuration there. You know, we're not setting up the debug logger and the console logger. Uh, that's because the default web host builder is doing that for you as well. So you no longer need to add those. They're, they're already there. Also, because config is now available at the hosting layer, um, we can now leverage configuration as part of logging. So for configuring your log levels, we can now do that by default. And in fact, it works now for all of the logging providers, not just the console logger. Um, so if we, let's see, we're running the app. If I uh, pop open this tab. So this is a cool new tab in Visual Studio, this ASP.NET Core web server tab, which I think should show me log. Let's see if it's. Yeah, OK, so you see that? Like I, I refresh the page, and I'm getting some um, ASP.NET Core log entries in this new um, output tab in, uh, in Visual Studio. That's nice. So I can see these info, info level logs. Uh, what if we want more, though? Let's, let's, let's crank up the, the volume on the, the logging. So let's go to appsettings.json, and we'll add another little section here. Let's add a logging section. And then what we need to do is set the log level. Um, and so what are we going to set it to? So let's set the default lock level, like for all the providers, for everything. Uh, we're going to set it to, let's set it to the, the maximum, to trace. All right, we save that. And I don't need to restart the app. Uh, let's clear this so we can see the difference. And now if I go and refresh the app a couple times, is that going to pick up for me? Oh, 
Oh no, it's frozen up. <laughs> Let's see, maybe we can see it in the, uh, the output window instead. No. Uh, oh, I, th I think the app actually shut down. I don't know quite what happened there. Let's, let's go back. All right. Build worked. There. Okay. Yeah. So now we're seeing it. The, the info and debug uh, level traces. Um, if I don't want those debug level traces, we can set it back. Let's go to, I don't know, let's go to say information. Okay. And then we can clear. And now when we refresh the page, we would expect to see only info level logs. So that's cool. So you can use config to configure your log filters. It's on by default. You just edit and save and, and your way you go. And this nice new uh, feature in VS where you can see your log output uh, really easy, this ASP.NET Core web server tab. All right. So that's getting started with ASP.NET Core, uh, things that we've simplified to make getting started faster. Uh, let's now take a deeper look into Razor Pages. Let, I think we can leave this app now. This was sort of an empty app getting started from scratch. But of course, we have lovely templates in uh, Visual Studio. So let's check those out. I'm going to create a new ASP.NET Core web app. Uh, I think we can leave that one behind. All right. And here's the new ASP.NET Core web application dialog. So first of all, you notice that there's some, some nice new UI here where you can easily pick whether or not you want to target .NET Core versus .NET Framework. Of course, when I use .NET Core, and you can pick which ASP.NET Core version you want to use. I'm going to use the latest. And then we have the usual suspects here for our templates. Uh, we also have some new ones. Notice that there are new, two web application templates now. Um, the model view controller template, that's the one that's always been there. It has controllers. It has views. Um, the new default one, though, is now using Razor Pages, because we just think it's a, a simpler way to, to do UI. Now, the, all the controllers and views, that stuff is still there. It still works. And in fact, uh, you can mix the two technologies. You can have Razor Pages and controllers and views within the same app. And sometimes there are good reasons to, to do that. Like you want some Web API endpoints, and you also want some UI. Use controllers for your endpoints. Use Razor Pages for your UI. So let's, let's create a Razor Pages-based app. I'm also going to turn on authentication. And let's do that. Oh, I didn't, I didn't point it out, but there were, I hope you saw on that page, there were also those new spa templates. We'll go back to that in a bit, but like the Angular templates react. We'll, we'll show those in a second. OK, so now we have a, uh, a much more fully, fully featured application. Let's go ahead and get this guy running. Um, and let's look at Razor Pages. So that, remember, we created that pages directory to, to get started with Razor Pages. And, and this app has, has a pages directory. This app you know, has the standard you know, three tabs that all of our templates do, home, about, and contact. And those are just pages. So for example, home, that's this index CSHTML. About is about CSHTML. And contact is contact CSHTML. It's just that simple. And is what's really important is that Razor Pages is actually built on top of MVC. It really is MVC. It's just a feature of MVC. Um, it's a page-based way of doing UI. That means that all the normal MVC features, they just work. So if we look at this, you know, this, uh, this folder, like layout, that's an MVC feature. It's there. It just works. You know, partial views, that just works. Uh, view imports, view start, all these things are just normal MVC features. They apply to Razor Pages just as much as they do to MVC, um, that's, which is great. So that means all your, you know, your knowledge about MVC carries forward. OK, um, now the routing in Razor Pages, though, is, is what's really different. The, the routes to these pages is just determined by where it is on disk. So for example, if we go back to the app and we see this like login uh, page, uh, this account slash login is what I'm seeing in the URL, well, that page is handled by you know, account login CSHTML. So the, the path to the page, that determines its route. Now, Razor Pages is really great. Uh, at doing like forms-based UI. And I'm going to show you how you can create a really quick form using Razor Pages. OK, so um, let's go to the contact page. And let's, let's look at it in the UI as well so we can see what we're doing. All right, so first, what I'm going to do is, um, you know, before when we created a Razor page, we just had a CSHTML file. But notice you can also have a you know, kind of like a code behind file, what we call a page model. Let me give myself a little more space, a page model. So, you still get the nice separation of concerns in Razor Pages that you do with MVC. You still have you know, sort of the view part of the page and then the logic part of the page that you can inject stuff into and test and has you know, your business logic. Uh, so the separation is still there. And it's done by these page models. And you, you just reference your page model in your, your page using the at model directive. So at model, contact model is pointing at our page model class. OK, great. And you can define page uh, handlers on your page model to handle different HTTP verbs, like on get, on post, and so forth. Now what I want to do here is I just want to add a class. I'm going to add a contact 
class to represent our new context. Well, what I want is a, a form where someone can provide their name and email address and get contacted uh, about you know, our great products or whatever. Oh, but I, I see I have a question from the audience about uh, whether or not custom templates uh, can be added into the, 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 the new ASP.NET Core dialog. And the answer is yes, actually, you can. You can write a, a Visual Studio extension and create a, you know, a, a .NET new, Core new template, and uh, you can actually install your template uh, in, into Visual Studio. That's actually possible. Um, we can provide links on how to do that later. All right, so uh, let's create our contact class. I'm going to uh, add a name. And let's also add an email address property. Okay. Now I also want to add some data annotations. Let's say that the name is required. We just need to resolve a namespace on that one. Okay, good. And then for the email address, let's say it's required. And well, let's also say that's an email address. Okay, great. Now um, I'm going to add to my page model a contact property that I can then use. So let's call it contact. <clears throat> All right. And that's what I'm now going to use to actually generate my form. So let's go over to the CSHTML and let's add a form here. You know, we, we, could, I could, we could hand type this, right? Uh, I don't, I don't want to you know, bore you. But uh, uh, so, so instead, I have a, a little snippet that I can use to, to add that form real quick. Uh, and my snippet manager, also known as Notepad. OK, great. So let's add the, the form to the contact page. And this is a pretty simple form. It basically has two fields, and it's using that contact property on the page model to generate a field for the name and for the email address. And all the tag helpers, they work. All that stuff is the same. Remember, it's just MVC. OK, so now we should have a form. If I save this and go back to my contact page and refresh, let's see. Give me a chance to rebuild. Yeah, yeah. So there's our form. Now it doesn't do anything yet. So we need, like, when we click the, the button, that that post can actually go someplace. So let's add the now the server side piece for this. Uh, let's go back to our page model. And remember, we had these page handlers. So I'm going to add a on post page handler. This is going to return an I action result, just like you would in MVC. It's again, it's just MVC. So on post. And what do we want to do in here? Um, like if the model state right is valid. Or is not valid actually. We're just going to render the page. So return page. Okay. Otherwise, like normally in here, you would like save contact to your database. Um, we won't do that for, for this demo, but that's where that logic would normally go. Uh, and then if everything's good, then we probably just want to uh, redirect back to the page, right? Like po get po uh, post redirect, like that, that pattern is what we want to use here. Post redirect get, sorry. Ah, got it. Got it back. Uh, redirect to page. I think that's what we want. All right, I'm going to need to, it looks like I need to just resolve a namespace. And good. Okay, so that should now, you know, get a post request from the page that should go here. And well, what I want is now to bind the contact that got sent. I could put it as an argument right in the page handler. That does work like normal model binding. But we've already got this property right here. Why don't we just use that? So there's a new feature in Razor Pages where you can just say bind property. Just you know, model bind to this property when the request comes in. This feature works in MVC controllers now as well. And so I would expect now any posted contacts would go there. So that's, that's kind of convenient. Uh, let's see if that, uh, how can we tell if that works? So to tell that that's actually working, why don't we do the following? Let's have like a success message at the end. We've already got this message property up top. So let's say message equals uh, thanks. And let's get the contact name. Uh, we'll contact you via, and let's get the email address, contact.email uh, soon. Okay? So we'll set the, this message, and then, oh, when we redirect, we want that message to be displayed, which means that message has to survive a redirect. How are we going to do that? Well, MVC has a nice feature for doing that. It's called temp data. So I could actually set that message in temp data and, and, and use it that way. But there's actually a better way now with Razor Pages. We can take this message property and attribute it with temp data. And what that will do is that property will now be backed by temp data. When you set it, it will get set into temp data. When you get it, it will get it from temp data. So that's super convenient. And then wh when we do the redirect and we get back, we probably don't want to clear out the message. So let's, let's get rid of that little bit of code. OK. And then is the, does the view look all right, like the message being displayed? Yeah, so we have a little bit of code up here displaying the message. That's good. Let's, let's format this a little bit better. Let's give it a class, a bootstrap class of text, uh, what, uh, success. Let's make it green. Okay, does that work? 
Okay, so I saved it. Uh, so first of all, let's make sure that the, um, uh, the validation stuff is working. So if I submit with like nothing, like I would expect to get some validation error saying, you know, stuff's required. Okay, good. If I put my name in here and then put like foo for an email address, I would expect, yeah, okay, it's not an email address. So that's the validation's working. Uh, let's put my email address in here and let's submit. And then, yeah, so it must have bounced. So thanks, Daniel Roth. We'll contact you via your, your email address. Okay, so that's how you can quickly build forms with Razor Pages. It's super simple. And notice the features work in MVC too, like temp data, bind, bind property, all that stuff. It also works in, uh, in MVC controllers because it's, it's all really the same framework. All right, so that's Razor Pages. And there's a talk later this week where, where you can learn all about Razor Pages that I believe Steve Smith will be presenting, and you should definitely check that out. Uh, next, I want to show you about the uh, authentication revamp that we've been doing in, uh, in ASP.NET Core 2.0. Um, this app has authentication enabled. So you know, if we go and register a new user, uh, I'll register you know, myself as a new user. Make sure I have a password I can remember. <laughs> All right, and let's register. OK, so uh, we need to migrate the database. So let's, let's go ahead and do that and refresh the page. Hopefully now I should be logged in, and I am. Okay, so that's that's all working. Let's look at the code for that though, because it's a little different. Uh, we've revamped the authentication system in 2.0 to make it easier to co to configure. So down here in my configure method, you'll notice that instead of having um, you know different middleware for each authentication scheme that you want to use, like cookies or Facebook or OIDC. Instead, there's just one. It's now just use authentication. It's one middleware. Uh, the reason for that is before when we had multiple middleware, uh, one for per authentication scheme, it was, it was too easy to configure them in conflicting ways. Like maybe you had two middleware that were both trying to actively authenticate you and that caused bad stuff to happen. Now with just one middleware, we can coordinate across all the authentication schemes. So how do you set up multiple authentication schemes now? Well, you do that now through DI. Like you, you add authentication schemes as services that the middleware then just picks up and, and uses. So it's a, it's a simpler model uh, and makes things much more robust. All right, so that's how authentication now works in 2.0. We've also added some nice new features. Like if we go into the template and let's go to my, my user and look at the, um, my uh, managing my, my user account. We've, you can see we did a, a little bit of a overhaul on the UI here, so it looks a lot nicer. Uh, but one of the cool features is support for two-factor authentication. Now we've had that before, like using SMS text messages, but now it's super simple to set it up using uh, uh, authenticator apps. So I want to add, sure, I want to add an authenticator app. Let's turn on two-factor authentication. And you can see I've got this page. Now, um, uh, normally there would be like a QR code here, so you could just like snap a picture and, and set up your authenticator app. Um, you, we have some documentation on how that's, it's really easy to set up. You just drop a little JavaScript into the page and it'll light up. Uh, I believe Barry Dorans later this week is going to have a, you know, a deeper dive into authentication and, and setting this up, so you can see that then. But just for a simple demo, uh, having the authenticator key right here, that's, that's, that's sufficient. And in fact, I think there's like, a, like an online uh, Authenticator app that I can just use. Let me go and find that. Yeah, this geoth thing. It's kind of cool. It's just a little simple authenticator app in a browser. Uh, so let's uh, add a new account. Let's call it .NET Conf or whatever. And I'll put my secret key that everyone in the world can see right now. So I'm going to add that. Okay. So the one-time password nine zero eight four two six nine zero eight four two six, and that should work. All right, cool. So that, that worked, and now it's giving me a bunch of recovery codes. Like if I lost my phone, um, these are codes that I can use to log in if I no longer have my device. So I better put those in a safe spot. So you know, I'm going to get my safe storage mechanism, also known as Notepad, and uh, I'll just tuck that away. Okay, so now if I log out and then try to log back in, uh, should like challenge me for two-factor authentication. Let's see, does it do that? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, don't save my password. That's fine. Uh, if I put in like a random number here. Uh, yeah, can't, can't log in. If I go back to my authenticator app, what is it? Uh, 742063. Let's see, 742063. And can I log in? Yeah. All right, cool. And if I, um, if I do that again, but this time if I'm like, I don't have my authenticator app, uh, what do I do then? So let's, let's log in one more time. And if we log in, now, so notice that down here, there's don't have access to your authenticator device. You can log in with a recovery code. So that's where I can use those codes that thankfully I safely stored. Uh, let's just make sure that if I type some garbage in there that, yeah, that doesn't work. But if I put in a real recovery code, 
yeah, then I can log in. Okay, and those are one-time use. So that's you know two of two FA using Authenticator apps. It's just there in the templates. You can use it. Learn more later this week when uh, by watching Barry Dorans' talk. Okay, so that's revamped authentication. Let's go take a peek now at um, those SPA templates, those uh, single-page application templates that we saw previously. All right, I think what I'll do, I'll, I'll uh, let's pop up another version, uh, another instance of Visual Studio. And we'll do following project. Oh, I see that we've got, while wow, we're waiting for this, I can answer some questions. So can Razor Pages be used to migrate from ASP.NET Web Forms? So Razor Pages you know, has some similarities to Web Forms, but it's not Web Forms. Like, it is a different model. So uh, you could migrate from Web Forms to Razor Pages, but that would be still a fairly substantial code rewrite, because Razor Pages is not meant to be Web Forms. So if you have a big Web Forms code base, it'll still be a fair amount of work. It's possible, but uh, it's not like you know just copy your ASPX pages and just have everything work. All right, let's do. Uh, remember, let's go back to file new project. And remember, we saw the, all those other templates before with fancy icons. Like I can now build an ASPX core app with with Angular or with React or React and Redux. Um, let's create one with Angular. Now uh, this create. I can do this right now. It does take a little bit of time. Because uh, you know we're using npm here, and restoring all those npm packages actually takes a little while. Um, instead of waiting for that to fully warm up, I think I've already got one set up. Let's just uh, go to this Angular app that I've already got, and we'll just use that one instead. Instead of waiting for npm to download all that stuff. All right. While I'm waiting for this, I'll answer one more question. Um, what's the difference between Web Forms and Razor, except for the markup syntax? Uh, isn't it the opposite of separation concerns, where the view should, uh, should be dumb. So um, Web Forms and Razor, like I said, they're similar in terms of their, their page model. Um, and yes, they do have a different, um, uh, a different templating engine that they use. But it's much more than that. Like, like uh, Web Forms has a full in-memory DOM. Razor Pages does, doesn't have that. There's a bunch of things. Like Web, Web Forms has a controls model. Razor Pages has, has tag helpers. But it's still, it's a very different thing. Um, you can still keep your, you know, your HTML DOM. Like it can just be, still be a view based off of that page model that I showed before. All your logic lives in the page model. And that you can you know, new up and test and unit test. Um, and that's really where your logic should lie. So by default, actually, when you add uh, Razor Pages to a new project, we will give you both that CSHTML file and the backing page model. OK, so here's, my, here's an Angular app. Let's just go ahead and run this. And this is set up with ASP.NET Core, with Angular. You know, the purpose of these SPA templates is they take all these you know, JavaScript uh, technologies, you know, new JavaScript technologies like Angular and TypeScript and Webpack, and they set them all up for you. So you can save yourself you know, the hours of head scratching trying to figure out how you get all those things uh, to work together. And they also enable a lot of really nice, uh, fancy advanced features so that you don't have to figure that out either. All right, is this, uh, is this running for me yet? Let's see. No, we're still. Did I not hit run? I thought I hit run. Let's go back. I think it's trying. <laughs> Maybe I have too many uh, instances of yes trying to do it at the same time. Let's see if we can close one of these. Well, so while we wait for it to to recover, the um, there it goes. So that that, that went away. Yeah, there we're gonna. All right, now it seems to be okay. Control F five. There we go. Make it big again, and it's building, and build succeeded. OK, great. Now we've got our Angular plus ASP.NET Core app. Um, so some things that uh, these templates enable is like, for example, uh, some uh, features of Webpack, like uh, hot module reload. So Webpack is a, you know, a module bundler. It knows about all the modules in your app, and then it produces some static assets based off of those modules that can be optimized, you know, bundled, and minified. Um, if we look at this app, all it's got is like a little counter page that you can click on and increments a, a number. There's also a fetch data page that you know, makes a request to, this, to a, an ASP.NET Core Web API, pulls down some JSON data, and then renders it dynamically on the screen. So now let's say you want to change something on one of these pages. Let, let me put this actually side by side with my uh, Visual Studio project. All right, great. And let's go to one of the components. So all the Angular stuff's in this client app folder. Let's go to, yeah, let's go to the, this uh, weather forecast uh, component. So let's go to fetch data. And let's go into the HTML. All right, cool. And we'll hide the solution explorer so we have a little more space. Uh, it currently says hot weather forecast. Let's 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 put really hot weather forecast. And I'm just going to save 
this HTML file, and you see that the browser automatically refreshed. I didn't do a manual refresh in the browser. That's hot module reload, where Webpack knows about all your modules. It can detect which one's changed, and then it can sort of swap in the changed module into your application without you even having to, to refresh the browser. So that's pretty nice. Um, other things that are nice, I mean, all this code in here is actually TypeScript. So this is you know, TypeScript that's being compiled into JavaScript. But um, debugging that code is actually very straightforward. If we go into the, um, the browser debugger, let's go look for, actually, let's go to like the counter page. And let's look at, yeah, I've actually already got it up here, countercomponents.ts. So this is the, you know, to show you how I found that. Oops, not that one. Let's do a control O and do the countercomponent.ts, and there it is. All right, and I can set a breakpoint actually here in, you know, this is TypeScript. And then when I uh, click the button, you know, my breakpoint gets hit. So all the source map uh, setup is already done for you here, so you can do uh, simple debugging within the browser. And we can keep on going. You know, other things that are, that are cool here, the, um, uh, we've also enabled fancy features like pre-rendering on the, on the server. So if we, let's, let's run this app. What is, what is pre-rendering? Well, normally with a single page app framework, you download all this JavaScript and that needs to load and set up the DOM and then give it to the browser and render on the screen. Well, that takes time. So sometimes the initial page load can take a little while. Pre-render is a way to you know, quickly pre-render the page uh, so that your users see something reasonable while the rest of the JavaScript gets loaded in the background. It's a little tricky to set up, but we, in these templates, we set it up for you so you don't even have to worry about it. If I go back to the, the browser tools, and let's look at the network, and then let's just, I think we can just refresh the page. Okay, you see how like the, the network trace that there's an initial initial load of the first page and then all the rest of the stuff happens. And that first that one was a little slow. Let's see if we can yeah, so in the first page, you know, you get you know a couple hundred milliseconds to get the initial uh, render of the page, and then all the JavaScript is being loaded in the in the background. So that's really nice. So lots of lots of things being set up for you makes it really easy to get started with using these single page app frameworks. Okay. Um, what do we want to do next? Let's talk about uh, performance performance in ASP.NET Core. So let's compare, for, let's talk more about startup performance, and let's compare startup performance of 1.1 uh, and uh, 2.0. So I think we can close this stuff. Um, what I've got here, let me, uh, let's switch directories now to um, my uh, little sample project. I think it's in, yeah, this guy, so startup. Time test. Okay, so in here, let me let me open this up in Visual Studio Code so we can just see what these two apps are. These are two apps, one implemented in 1.1 and one implemented in 2.0 that do a little like startup perf test. I'll show you what the code looks like. The apps are exactly the same. They're both using MVC, you know, rendering views. But basically, they start a stopwatch and then they just issue an HTTP client request to the app and see how long it takes for that first request to come back and time it and just see what the, start, the startup perf is. Okay. Um, great, and so the 2.0 app looks exactly the same. It's got the same code. The only difference here is that it's using the new uh, web host builder, uh, default web host builder model, so like you would in a normal ASP.NET Core 2.0 app. Okay, so let's first go to the 1.1 app, and I'm going to .NET, and I'm going to I'm going to run the published version of the application. So bin debug publish, and what is it like starter? Yeah, this one. Startup time test 11.dll. You just point the .NET runner at the published DLL. If we run this, and we'll run it a few times, let it warm up. Let's see, the first execution, that took about you know, almost four seconds. The second execution took you know, under, under three seconds, a little better. And the third execution took about, about three seconds. So, so we we're, we're, we're seem to be plateauing there. You know, and there's a lot of stuff that's happening in that, that, uh, those seconds, like you know, we're compiling the razor views, we're jitting everything, uh, and that all takes time. In 2.0, what does that look like? Well, let's go to... Startup time test 2.0, and we'll do exactly the same thing. .NET, and let's get the published version of the application. Uh, what is it? Start that guy. So startup time test 2.0.dll, and let's run that. You know, half a second. You know, half a second. Half a second. So major perf improvement on startup. Where does that come from? Well, like I said, we now pre-compile. Uh, the views and pages, so they don't have to be compiled at runtime anymore. That's a major savings. Also, remember I'd mentioned that uh, runtime store feature from, from before? The runtime store has all of the ASP.NET Core binaries there, and they're already cross-gen, so we, we save the time of the, the jitter uh, as well uh, when starting up these applications, and that's how it gets faster. Now, if we actually uh, look 
at the, uh, the published apps. Let me see if I can pull those up side by side. So let's look at, um, let's look at the 201. Well, let's look at the 111 first. Yeah, let's look at this one. So we go into, nope, 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 nope. Let's go into uh, bin, debug, 11, publish. So notice in 11, you had to bring all this stuff with you. And it, you know, it was quite a bit of stuff. If we look at the, the size of this folder, it's about what, like uh, 15, uh, 17 megabytes of binaries. And that's because all those, all those ASP.NET Core binaries had to come with the application. If we compare that to, to 2.0, if you look at the published version of the app, notice it's significantly smaller. And that's because of the runtime store. You no longer have to bring those binaries with you. They're already there. And so your app startups fast. And uh, also, your publish time is significantly less because you have to transfer much, uh, much uh, fewer bits. Now, I did say that the views were pre-compiled. And we can see that. Like, there's the uh, pre-compiled views.dll. All right? So there, that's working. So that's startup performance. Of course, that's not the only type of performance we care about. Um, we also care about throughput, like how fast the application runs. Uh, in the latest, was it Tech Empower Round 15 benchmark? Let's look at uh, that. You know, big warning sign that, uh, of course, these results are still preliminary. They're still being uh, you know, run, uh, run to get the final results. But let's look at least where things currently stand. Uh, Round 15 has the 2.0 RTM bits of ASP.NET Core. Let's look at the difference between round 14, which had 1-1 one, one bits, versus uh, round 15 with this preview 2. And let's see. Let's look for ASP.NET Core. There it is. All right, cool. So as you can see down here uh, in the plain text uh, benchmark, we're getting a 20% uh, increase in, in throughput. So your app runs faster. It starts up faster. Uh, publish time is faster. So performance uh, across the board. OK, so that's performance. Uh, last thing I want to show you is that idea of uh, seamless uh, diagnostics, where you get you know, great visibility into your application without you having to write a line of code. You know, previous versions of ASP.NET Core, you know, we wanted you to have telemetry, we wanted you to have diagnostics. And so we even added like, you know, app insights uh, packages and code to your application to help you do that. Um, got feedback that not, not everyone appreciated the, us adding those things. And so what we've done in ASP.NET Core 2.0, we now have this feature called Light Up, where we can light up features in the host uh, that your app uh, can then take advantage of without you uh, having to write a single line of code or add any, add any packages. Uh, and that's actually how we can now light up like uh, great telemetry using App Insights both in Azure and also uh, from, the, from within Visual Studio. I think Scott Hunter showed this earlier today where you know, if you have an app, like I, I have, here's the portal. I have an app, an ASP.NET Core 2.0 app that I published previously. It's this App Insights Light Up application. And you publish it to Azure. Azure knows now that that's an ASP.NET Core 2.0 application. And it can light up uh, App Insights for you. See this banner at the top? Click here to access App Insights for monitoring and profiling for your ASP.NET Core app. And if you click that, then you can actually provision App Insights, and we can light up the integration into your application. And that includes things like hooking the logging providers, uh, injecting JavaScript into your, uh, into your pages so that you can uh, see all the interactions that are happening on your pages. So for this app, I've already done that. And you can see I've, I get a whole bunch of really cool App Insights data uh, that, that shows up. And that's just by virtue of publishing and running in Azure. You get similar features, though, that also happen within Visual Studio. And that's what I want to show you next. So here's the app we were working on previously, you know, the one that we were messing around with, Razor Pages with. Let me now run this in the debugger. While I wait for this to run, I'm going to take, take another question. Is the temp data attribute similar to view state? Any concerns we should have about performance? So I, I had showed that temp data attribute where it made it really easy to put stuff in temp state and get it out. Uh, 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 temp data and get it out. Uh, temp data is actually pretty different from view state, where view state was really trying to maintain you know, the visual state of your application. Temp data is really only meant for those like one hop requests. Like you put something in there and you pull it out again and it's gone. Like it's, it's just something so you can survive a redirect. It's not intended to maintain a full visual state of your application. All right, so we've got our app running now in the debugger. And you know, if we, let's click a few things. If we go look in the diagnostic tools, you know, if we click on events, first thing to notice is that there's all these App Insights events that are now being triggered. You know, get contact and information about that. So you get some light up that's happening in the diagnostic tools. Also, you see this App Insights button. 
this is a really pretty neat UI. Like this gives you a full query interface over all of the App Insights data. Not, not, not App Insights data that's going to the server. Like this isn't, uh, unless you want it to, this is not actually going and, and feeding uh, data to the service. But there's like a, sort of like a local App Insights store that you can just leverage to get this experience while you're doing development. So you know, I've had all 15 requests to this application. Let's, uh, let's just look at the requests. And then let's, uh, I don't know, let's pick a, here's the request to get contact. I can click on that. I can look and track the operation and I get like a breakdown of the performance of that operation as all the different stages of the op operation occurred. So this is pretty cool as well. And this just, again, just lights up uh, when you run your app in Visual Studio. And there's no App Insights code in the, the application at all. You know, one last thing I'll show about LightUp that I think is just kind of mind-boggling. If we look at the Azure deployed version um, that's actually using the App Insights surface, uh, what is it? App Insights uh, LightUp. Uh, do I just have the? Be nice if we could just. How could I get this wrong? Azure Websites .net. Is that right? Yes, of course it's right. All right. So if we look at the Azure deployed version of the app, if I F12, and let's look at the. Um, oh, I think. I hope, this, I hope this is right. Let's look at the source. And if we look at the, the scripts, now you see like, like down here, there's like injected scripts into my app in order to light up App Insights without me having to do anything. Like you might wonder, how does that work? How did you like, you know, inject the App Insights uh, code into, into those pages? Well, there's actually head and body tag helpers now in ASP.NET Core. And those head and body tag helpers allow you to append content to the head and body uh, using services. So the App Insights LightUp logic just adds services uh, to your application. And those services then get a chance to add additional content to your pages. So that, those are called tag helper components. Again, another new feature in ASP.NET Core. All right, so that's seamless diagnostics. All right, so let's stop this. And let's go back to the slides. All right, so here's all the things that we've shown you today, things that are new in ASP.NET Core 2.0. Showed how it's easier to get started, um, fewer files, fewer lines of code. We showed Razor Pages, a lot more on Razor Pages coming later this week, so be sure to check it out. We only just touched on it here. Um, new revamped authentication system, support for two-factor auth using uh, authenticator apps. Definitely check out Barry Doran's talk later this week to learn more about that. We showed some of the spa templates. I'll be talking more about that later this week. Uh, we showed how page and view compilations enabled by default, and there's how performance is increased across the board, startup time, uh, throughput time, uh, the deployment time by having a smaller publish size, and we get seamless li uh, light up uh, diagnostics. Okay, now those aren't the only new features in ASP.NET Core. Those are only the ones that I had time to, to show you today. There's a whole bunch of, of more stuff that's available that you can check out. Uh, so first of all, we've done a lot of hardening work on Kestrel, so Kestrel can now be used as an edge server. Uh, we, hadn't, we had recommended against that in the, in the past because Kestrel was a very new HTTP server and we wanted to have time to really bang on it and harden it. Uh, we feel like we've done that work now and we feel like it's, it's, we're comfortable with being used as an edge server. We still generally recommend that it's a good idea to have a reverse proxy in front of it, but we, it's ready, ready to go. Uh, we now support uh, C Sharp 7.1 in, in, uh, in Razor syntax, so you can use the latest C Sharp features. Uh, for web APIs, we've added some nice features. We've added support for media type suffixes, so like you know, plus JSON or plus XML that you can then leverage during content negotiation. Uh, tag helper components we talked about. And then uh, iHost startup, that's the ability to light up new features in ASP.NET Core. That's the, 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 the lower level piece that allows us to, for example, add app insights into your app without you having to add a line of code. And then finally, support for background tasks using iHosted startup. So that's the full list of stuff that you can play around with. I encourage you to do so. Go to dot.net slash core, download and install .net core 2.0, go grab Visual Studio and get the tooling, and have a lot of fun. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to, 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 to answer them and uh, come check us out.